Thank you, Steve. Uh, no, it's a challenge to be back here and speak to you on uh, the topic that I probably have chosen. Uh, uh, when I read the, the title here, Studies on Elite Athletes to Develop and to Understand, I don't uh, know if you uh, can follow what I uh, am uh, trying to say. But uh, maybe it's a little bit more clear if we take the next uh, uh, then the graph here where uh, sport or exercise science, you know, it can be very many different things. And, uh, and uh, the most common is probably, and, and very important of course, to describe the demands, characteristics or special effect on the body when performing a speci specific physical activity, sport, with those uh, methods that are available in those type of basic sciences related to, the, should we say, the theory of physical activity and sport. Uh, but it can also be to evaluate the range of performance or regulatory capacity of organs in the human body. Uh, quite a few are, are interested in that particular aspect. And then there are people like me then use exercise as an intervention just to learn more about the human body. Uh, and uh, some, uh, I would not say that very seriously, but at least they say that I use these athletes to, yeah, to, to get that type of information. And um, I don't know if that's really fair, because uh, uh, if you learn a little bit about the more basal mechanism that regulates bodily functions, uh, and try to give it back uh, when it comes to how to prepare training, how to prepare to go to altitude, how to prepare to uh, perform in a hot uh, environment and so on. I think uh, it comes uh, very close to you know, the top one here, describe the demand and then also uh, to adjust for that. But uh, uh, what I will speak about today, and that will be primarily, you know, I've used exercise uh, just to learn more about the human body, and uh, part of it can, can definitely be used in the more, uh, say, applied sense as well. So the structure here, uh, there are three topics then that I will try to cover, we will see how time goes. And uh, the first I have called, do not challenge a dogma. And the message, and the, say the area, that is uh, no link between muscle fiber types and metabolic capacity. So that's the first one. And then uh, uh, it's unavoidable, at least with the background that I have, not to touch the middle one in the search uh, of limits. And of course, uh, there is no consensus today, and I think that there will never be, and it uh, relates to central or peripheral limitation to peak oxygen uptake. Uh, and the last, and I hope I get a little bit time <laughs> for it at the end, uh, muscle training status and the heart rate regulation. It's still unsolved. I had the first data on the topic in the 1970s. But unfortunately, I haven't paid enough attention to it. So now, 40 years later, it's still uh, far from solved. And I want to share with you uh, some of the, say, uh, thoughts uh, on that particular topic. And it has, uh, of course, important uh, uh, applications, not only for sports people, but for people in, in general. But start with the first one, that's dogma about uh, the link between fiber types and uh, various, uh, say, characteristics, contractile as well as uh, metabolic of the muscle fiber. Uh, some of you may have seen various versions of this, and it's just telling that uh, uh, when we look on the type 1 slow uh, myosin heavy chain isoform, the slow fiber type, uh, we will say, that one 
uh, cannot contract very fast. Uh, it has lots of mitochondria, the green uh, things that are inside the cell, and have lots of capillary, capillaries. And then if you go to the type 2A fiber, fast myosin heavy chain isoform, uh, then less of the mitochondria, less of the capillaries, and then type 2X, uh, uh, even less with capillaries and capillaries. And uh, what it then the whole, let's say, issue is, uh, is it really so that there is this very close coupling? And uh, can we not uncouple the metabolic capacity from the contractile characteristics? And uh, there are several reasons why people don't think that there is this uncoupling, and that's what I will argue that there is. Now, uh, I uh, start then a little bit just with uh, how the human muscle uh, then uh, perform and the tension velocity relationship. And uh, now there are fancy machines where you can measure muscle strength. But, you know, uh, A.V. Hill in the 1920s, he constructed the wheel that is really maybe the best thing to use if you want to see how quick uh, a muscle can contract and then see what uh, force that you can uh, generate. You can see the wheel is just a, a heavy one and you can have a, a, uh, then a little uh, motor engine that can keep it at a given speed so that uh, you don't need to use tension of the muscle for the acceleration and then you can get pretty good uh, measurements of the, the force velocity relationships and in that particular study you can see it's uh, in not uh, a fresh one but the data I think are very very valid and uh, you can see velocity uh, on the x-axis and the force uh, on the y-axis and, and what is I think in addition to that typical velocity force uh, relationship, there is a large, very, very large individual variation. And why? And the answer to that is uh, very easy. If you have taken a muscle biopsy, in this case the muscle biceps brachii, and checked for fiber types, uh, you can see that uh, the percent uh, FT area, fast twitch uh, fiber, myosin heavy chain uh, 2A or 2X, um, they, uh, uh, it's uh, almost a straight one-to-one -one relationship with uh, the, the force that can be developed. You can see there are some open circles and some uh, um, field circles, and that's uh, both girls and boys, or males and females. And, uh, just a side point, we usually try to use both males and females in so many of our studies and uh, as in this case they are very similar. Come, when you come down on that cellular level, you know, there is not a chance to see if this is a female muscle or a, or a male muscle. It's, it's the same and uh, uh, yeah, and this is a good evidence of, of that. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, today, the technique on this, uh, uh, in, in this field of uh, muscle research uh, has come uh, quite far. This is a study we did with Bottinelli. Uh, we were lucky to have a chance to work with him. He works in northern Italy, and he is an expert uh, taken then out uh, when he has got the muscle piece uh, from a biopsy, he can dissect out single fibers. And the Nils Örtumdal sitting up at the end here, he is also an expert on that type of a technique. Uh, and uh, then uh, with the uh, uh, electrophoretic technique up in the left corner, you can see how you, how you can identify if it is a type 1, 2A or a 2X fiber. And then he can use that fiber, uh, another part of it, you cut off a small piece and it's doing that electrophoretic study, or you can do it after the uh, more functional uh, parts of the experiment. But you can see then upper right, there you have the different fiber types, and uh, you can see the more of 2X fibers, 
uh, the, the higher uh, Vmax they can uh, perform and uh, that uh, is surprisingly close relationship. But what you also can see is that we don't only have pure fibers, type 1, 2A, 2X, we also have hybrid fibers or co-expression uh, both uh, myosin heavy chain uh, 1 and 2A or 2A and 2X. And now, uh, in the bottom part, you can see then the ordinary force velocity curve. Uh, and uh, as uh, the important, really, for the sports person uh, and also for us sometimes in the daily life, uh, that is uh, then the power. And uh, it's really a difference in power, but not as much as you see in other species, but it's big enough, you can see. It's uh, at least a factor of uh, three, uh, the difference in, in uh, uh, power. So the 2x uh, fiber is definitely then more explosive, if you call it so, than the 2a and the type 1. Now, uh, that's uh, then uh, the background on the contractile side. Uh, now, coming back to what is the dogma that we are fighting. And that goes back to studies in the 60s. Burke in, in the States, in Washington, he did beautiful studies on cats. And uh, he could then identify the motor neuron in the spinal cord and then check what uh, did the muscle fibers look like in that motor unit. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, then you have the, the fast switch to the left uh, and then uh, uh, he checked what kind of um, uh, force they could develop, uh, the twitch response there. And it, when you have a cat muscle, uh, there are larger differences uh, in the tension that can be developed. You, you can see it, it's more a factor of, uh, say, 10 or something like that than in man human muscle, it's two and a half, maybe three. And then, uh, further related to that, uh, you can see that they are different resistance to fatigue. That means uh, they are more or less uh, endurance type fibers. Nothing really new in that today. It's an old uh, finding. But then he gave them names, uh, fast uh, fatigable, fast uh, res uh, and, uh, fatigue resistance, and slow. Or uh, fast glycolytic, fast oxidative glycolytic, or slow oxidative. And uh, based on this figure, it's in very many textbooks, and all of you probably have seen this graph uh, before, uh, they have that in the back of their heads, so they think it's, uh, is it a fast fiber? Then it's glycolytic. If it is a slow fiber, it's oxidative. And uh, it can be that it is so. And uh, in some studies that we did, again, you can see this is a long time back, uh, where we also used that with dissecting fibers and checked for STH and oxidative enzyme, PFK, glycolytic enzyme, and also then the the, the substrate like and triglycerides, but if we take just the enzymes, as a good marker for mitochondrial enzyme activity, type 1, type 1, 2A, type 2A, and then 2A, X, uh, there is definitely a, a difference, um, and PFK the other way around. So, lots of data supporting that there is this link. But uh, uh, exactly from the same time, there is a study by also here from Sweden, uh, Eva Jansson and Lena Kaiser in Stockholm. Uh, they have these data and they are, I think, forgotten. No one ever mentioned them. And uh, uh, the runners here, uh, they are in, in fact the national team in orienteering. The day after beating uh, Norway in an important uh, national uh, then, uh, 
competition uh, and and uh, they were willing these uh, uh, top volunteers um, to uh, yeah, l allow me to take uh, biopsy from the gastroc uh, and we took also from the vastus and uh, you can see uh, the runners there the orienteers uh, in top shape at the time uh, they have something like four or five times high, higher uh, than uh, mitochondrial enzyme activity than the sedentary people. And the sedentary people, okay, there is a real difference from, um, no, yeah, between the type 2x as compared to the uh, slow twitch type 1 fiber. But five times higher in the orienteers and a small difference but not very large. So uh, then if you check on uh, type 1 fibers uh, at the bottom of the graph you can see that uh, they have uh, about the same number or relative number of uh, uh, type 1 fibers in their gastrocnemius. So uh, that gave an indication that uh, it's uh, hardly that very close match uh, uh, activity, lots of endurance type training that will definitely uh, affect mitochondrial biogenesis and improve the oxidative capacity of the muscle and it appears to be about the same in all fiber types, not that the distinct uh, coupling. Now, um, uh, before I go a little bit then into more say data uh, supporting this uncoupling. Uh, a short note the muscle fiber type transformations. Uh, we know that between 2x and 2a it goes back and forth. I mean if you're a little bit active then you get more 2a and if you are inactive uh, the 2x will uh, uh, increase. So uh, that and that happens over some few weeks. But the big question is between the two main fiber types, the type 2 versus type 1. Is it really a trans, say, uh, formation of uh, the myosin heavy chain isoforms to type 1 if you train endurance from the type 2a or 2x? Now, uh, as you can see, there are lots of studies using uh, the histochemical uh, technique uh, where you stain, uh, you have a cross section and then stain. Uh, but if you use the single fiber, dissect uh, out the fibers and check with the electrophoretic technique uh, the uh, myosin heavy chain, there is not one study in the world. Uh, there are not that many. Yeah. I don't know if you can imagine, you know. Uh, sitting there, a biopsy may have uh, 800 fibers. It takes three, four days to dissect out uh, 50, 60, 70 fibers and then type them and uh, or run the electrophoretic things and so on. So it's not an easy study to do. Uh, 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 and you can always say how representative are those fibers that you dissect out. You know, if you take the biceps, uh, uh, I happen to know rather well how many fibers you have in the biceps. You have, uh, at the age of 25, 30, you have around 500,000 fibers. And then you get the biopsy with maybe 1,000 fibers and you can dissect out half of them. That's 500 out of 500,000. Is that representative? So, you know, yeah, yeah I think uh, not even in your lifetime there will be a final answer, but uh, the indications are that uh, uh, it's really difficult to demonstrate that there is a true transformation from type 2a to type 1, regardless how much of uh, uh, endurance type training that you perform easy to uh, demonstrate, uh, easy, but you see what you think is a transformation if you use histochemistry. And to the right then there is the uh, 
say, an, a try to explain why that is the case. And we talked before about that you have uh, these hybrid fibers, those uh, expressing uh, more than one type of myosin he heavy chain isoform. And it so happens that uh, the type 1 uh, myosin heavy chain in the histochemical staining is, say, more say, powerful. So if you have one expressing one two way, it will look like a type 1 fiber. So you overestimate the type 1 fiber. And you may well uh, uh, have some or more hybrid fibers uh, after endurance training. But the full transition, that's definitely very, very hard to uh, demonstrate. Uh, the older you are, the more of those uh, hybrid fibers uh, uh, can, can be found. And if you were quick and looked on that study by Bottinelli, uh, there in fact some very, very few percent of the fibers, they have all three fiber types. That's all three myosin heavy chain isoforms, but that's uh, less than one percent. So, so they are there, but uh, functionally of course uh, the pure fibers, that's what we have most of in our uh, muscles. Now, uh, this is just uh, more of a parenthesis, uh, but uh, uh, we have studied lots of East African runners in Kenya, uh, and uh, some others from the States have studied West Africans. And uh, you can see that uh, the percentage of the type 1 slow twitch uh, is uh, much higher in the East Africans than the West Africans. And uh, when we saw these data, uh, we uh, talked about the other genetic differences or, or is it so that it is uh, more selection uh, than that is a really true difference. And uh, the more we looked into it, at least in the East Africans, um, the Kenyans here, uh, if you take town boys, uh, just ordinary untrained uh, boys, uh, not old, very old, you can see, yeah, I mean, teenagers, 16 years old, the mean average age here. Um, you can see they, they have, just like we have, around 50 50 in, in the vastus lateralis muscle. But the range is from 41 to 67. If you take village boys, it's about the same, a tendency to a little bit more type 1 fibers. But those who have a talent for runners running uh, longer distances, they are uh, then uh, recruited to the high schools and get the chance to develop as uh, runners. And they have, you can see, a, a higher percentage, but it's still within that range that you see in the whole population. And uh, the way they then pick the talents uh, looks to be pretty good because the world champions, those to winning the gold medals in, in running in the Olympics, they have about the same. Uh, but again, the world champions, they, they are within the normal range of Kenyan uh, people. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very likely that then the difference between 54, 47, 54 to 66, 66, 68, that is just selection. Those who have more type 1, uh, they respond better to the endurance training and then uh, they uh, are those who uh, make su success as runners. So we don't have, we, or at least we can say we can't use uh, those type of data to say that there is uh, fiber conversion with endurance training. Now, uh, now a little bit more on this concept, but uh, then uh, on the molecular level, uh, because it has been found that there is one gene uh, in our muscles that is more important than maybe anyone else, and it's called a PGC1 alpha, it's a transcription factor, and uh, that has the ability to uh, find uh, various factors which have to be uh, put together uh, to activate a gene. 
and uh, the thinking is then that uh, when you exercise then uh, PGC1 alpha is upregulated and uh, can then better get uh, this uh, gene to become activated. And the gene is doing lots of things, but what is uh, most important is at the bottom there, where it says uh, with question mark, switch type 2 to type 1 fiber, and then uh, the other that is well demonstrated the mitochondrial and nuclear encoded genes that it activates those so that means we get more mitochondria uh, if that gene is uh, activated with our training. Now uh, what happened, uh, now first then demonstrate that it is true, uh, Perry, a guy in Canada, has a, I would say a very beautiful um, study recently published demonstrating that it is really this uh, type of event. You have an intervention, in this case uh, endurance exercise, uh, and then uh, you uh, activate that gene, you get more transcription of the PGC1 uh, alpha, and after a while you can see more of the protein of that PGC1 alpha, and then the next step you see that also a mitochondrial uh, enzyme has become elevated. Um, you c so the, um, those uh, up and downs, I don't have a pointer, so, but you, I think you can see it. These very sharp up and downs that after the training uh, session, and you can see the transcription, the PGC1 um, mRNA, is heavily increased and uh, it goes down a little bit with uh, the f two, two weeks of training here um, but um, the important part then is that then you see uh, that uh, the next step is that the PGC1 protein that stippled uh, already after two three training sessions you can see the protein and it increases gradually during the two weeks and then at the bottom you see the uh, uh, mitochondrial enzyme and its activity as a sign of that you have really got mitochondrial functional mitochondria and it goes gradually up so you have the transcription then translation into a protein and then making the mitochondria so so that's really the the type of events now uh, what has then been added, that's using transgenic mice, Nature art article 2002, and um, you, so you have a wild and uh, uh, then uh, transgenic mice, and you can see that uh, it's more, say, red muscle myo myoglobin in, in the uh, transgenic where you overexpress PGC1 alpha. But now, what they conclude is that uh, if you look at the bottom, there are cross sections and you can see uh, fiber types. What they push hard in, in this article is, have a look, we have an increase in type 1 fibers. And that's related to that you have more PGC1 alpha and at the same time we have these uh, typical oxidative adaptations as uh, uh, is then linked with uh, the PGC1 alpha and more or mitochondria. And after that article, uh, that has been then, uh, say, uh, a very, very strong support of what uh, you saw in the Burke uh, type of article uh, where he looked on contractile things, but then said, have a look, the fiber types, they are linked with a specific uh, metabolic uh, profile. So here he gave some very say, elegant type of data to support that whole thing. But looking more carefully on this uh, Nature article and Lin's uh, results, uh, th there is no close link between change in fiber types and the mitochondrial elevation. Frank Booth uh, 
he wrote a, a special little article uh, soon after that uh, other came out and said wrote uh, that resp- yeah, a response to Lin his conclusion pointing out that the elevation in type 1 fibers was less than 5% as compared to 2 to 300% elevation in mit- mitochondrial capacity so uh, uh, that uh, according to Frank at least and also to the way I look at it uh, there is not this strong coupling now uh, uh, there is one in the world who has tried to try to explain why uh, Lin Nature article is uh, not right and uh, the first article from from that group working in, in Switzerland uh, was published uh, just before Christmas last year. Uh, they tried to see uh, what could may impair uh, the upregulation of PGC1 alpha. It's no question it happens uh, with endurance training, and, and it's the key for the mitochondria to, to rise. Uh, but uh, uh, he was looking for could it be something in the um, say of the other changes that happens in the cytosol uh, that may block for it to then change fiber types or uh, then activate uh, the gene for the myosin heavy chain one isoform and uh, he could demonstrate that depending upon the type of pattern of activation of the uh, muscle if it was a uh, fast say type of uh, neural input to the muscle or a slow type uh, then uh, uh, the calcium in the cytosol uh, indeed was different and uh, the one with the uh, typical slow pattern uh, blocks for an effect on the myosin isoforms encoding yields so uh, now I don't know how, how well where you are in the, uh, this literature, but uh, Eccles and Baller, they had an important study in the 1960s. Eccles also got the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, in part for, for that type of work. What they did, they did cross innovations. A nerve to a fast muscle was placed on the slow muscle and vice versa on various animals. And uh, they also did the, the electric stimulation with either high type 2 fiber or low slow type 2 type 1 fiber frequency and could demonstrate that you could go back and forth in fiber types but it demands that you have a different type of neural input to the muscle or muscle unit and if you don't have that you can't change fiber types and if you run uh, say, uh, for hours you will not change then uh, that slow pattern it will be the slow pattern and with the slow pattern you don't get the fiber type change now uh, ending not only because Neil Sertenblad is here but his data from his lab um, uh, the uh, uh, they have beautiful data on, on uh, uh, mitochondria in in, uh, in human muscle uh, and also on, on cross country skiers and uh, uh, then the question here is in which muscle and in which species and you can see I don't know if, if you are familiar but uh, with the mitochondria but I think it stands uh, MI here and there and you can see that there are lots of them uh, here as well as glycogen granular in this but um, uh, which uh, muscle do you think it is? It's on cross-country skier, and uh, uh, do you know which is the most, uh, uh, or the muscle with most fast, twitch, fast twitch fibers in the body? Which muscle is that? You can, your anatomy, I presume. That's triceps bracket. That has the highest percentage of type 2 fibers. It, in some people it may be up to 80-90%, but generally you see 75-80. And cross-country skiers 
are fantastic because you know for this type of study because you know the ordinary people they don't use ex this extensor muscle very much but cross country skiers do you know that's a key muscle for the cross country skier so uh, uh, there you have lots of stimulation and you can see they have lots of uh, mitochondria and uh, this is triceps uh, muscle then on humans Norwegian cross-country skiers. And, uh, then uh, if uh, that's just the answer to that and if you take uh, those data that Nils Örtenblad and his group have uh, you can see vastus lateralis uh, they uh, have also in cross-country skiers quite high percentage of uh, uh, mitochondrial, myofibrillar placed in the uh, cell uh, close to the myofibrillar part and uh, the triceps brachii, triceps brachii uh, it's uh, uh, about the same or a tendency maybe to a little bit higher but the key thing you see above uh, vastus lateralis has a much lower percentage of type 2 fibers and the uh, triceps has the high percentage and then uh, they that type 2 fiber muscle has then if you say so the highest then mitochondrial uh, volume and uh, uh, this is uh, in another fraction of the mitochondria in the uh, in the in the same muscle now uh, so so coming to a close on this particular part uh, which has taken a little bit too long time but uh, uh, if you see uh, then a picture like this this is histochemistry and uh, you see a sprinter 9.9 .9, it's an american top sprinter uh, bottom the myosin heavy chain uh, staining and to the right you have a marathon runner not too bad 206 uh, and uh, uh, on the upper part you have a mitochondrial stain and you can see not much in uh, mitochondria in, in the sprinter but lots of it in the, in the marathon runner. Now, uh, what I have then tried to convince you is that uh, the bottom part that's inherited, you can do whatever you want in regard to training, you can't change it. You have to have then say manipulate with electrical stimulation with different with specific patterns but if you don't do that you can't change it uh, whereas the uh, plasticity of the muscle is enormous when it comes to mitochondria and then oxidative capacity uncoupled to the fiber type so that was that <laughs> uh, now uh, coming uh, and as you can see uh, I will be a little bit more than 45 minutes I can see a little bit uh, now uh, now I change over to that uh, more to limits maximal oxygen uptake uh, and uh, it's uh, then very natural to start with Hill A.V. Hill got a Nobel Prize 1922 uh, and uh, he was also a fantastic exercise physiologist but he wrote, the, say, the basic, uh, say, uh, uh, thinking at the time, which also has been proven to be the right way to think. However, however, much the speed be increased beyond this limit, no further increase in oxygen intake can occur. The heart, lungs, circulation and the diffusion of oxygen to the active muscle fibers have attained their maximal activity. As you know, Timothy Noakes has uh, challenged this, uh, I don't know how many times, uh, but uh, uh, he, he, uh, and he may be right, Timothy Noakes, that Hill, Hill himself didn't have the best uh, data on uh, leveling of oxygen uptake and so on. But uh, the, the, the important thing here is that Hill he had the understanding of what was really going on. Now there is a little special, uh, say, Swedish link to this, because there were two here in Sweden who worked on, on uh, measuring oxygen uptake during running, 
Uh, and that's uh, if you see NS Nils Stenström and GL uh, Göran Liljestrand, two Swedes. And uh, they have uh, highest speed uh, on, on the x-axis and then the auction uptake on the y-axis. And uh, if they had plotted their data uh, the way we plot it today, that's uh, the way it, it looked. Perfect. 1918. Uh, auction uptake increased to a certain level. Uh, and you can see the our, our, our respiratory exchange rates, your values, they also increased uh, just as we are used to see. But the important thing, this very clear leveling off. If these two guys had uh, plotted it this way, they had been the first to define maximal auction uptake. Now it is uh, defined, in fact, not really with actual data by, by Hill, but by Herbst, the German. Uh, a couple of years later, in fact, uh, ten years later than this. Oh, that was just a little historical mark. Now, uh, coming to uh, then what shocked the whole world working in this particular field. Uh, this is a paper by Nils Secker, a top rower, but also a very good physiologist in Copenhagen. And um, he did this study as may be familiar to s several of you, but uh, they exercised, as you can see at the bottom, with two legs, and then after 10 minutes they added the arms, and uh, they didn't really reach maximum oxygen uptake, but they were quite high when they combined arms with legs. But the important finding you have uh, in the middle and the top uh, panel. Cardiac output increased a little bit, you can see, 22 to 24 liters, but uh, that was not enough to supply the upper body and the arms. So you had to cause vasoconstriction to the legs uh, to be able to give some more blood to the upper body when it was exercising. And when it was, uh, say, shocking to the uh, word of cardiovascular physiology was that no one did believe at that time that you could cause vasoconstriction uh, of the blood flow to an exercising leg or exercising muscle. And no change in the work for the legs, but in spite of that you had that drop. And uh, uh, Nils and I have talked many times that we should do something together on the topic, but uh, Niels wanted to do it on rowers, and that was fine with me, uh, but uh, it didn't work because uh, the instrumentation uh, that we had to, to do, if you call it so, uh, didn't work on, on, on rowing. I mean, what it all, all is that if you want to put catheters in, in the vessels here, in, in rowing, bend so much so you bend also then the catheters, so you don't get a chance to f infuse anything or take out blood. So, uh, in, and then, uh, as I know, somehow from Busan, uh, he today said, I, uh, I, I thought of cross-country skiing, and then I checked on the, the, the uh, treadmill that you have there uh, with some skiers, and they both uh, did uh, diagonal and, and in the freestyle, and what was so surprising to me that, you know, in spite of high speed and uphill and so on, they moved around this area of the body, moved around maybe five centimeters. So that opened up uh, for using uh, skiers uh, because these catheters, you know, you can't handle them if they were moving around too much. So, uh, but we never. Uh, continued that uh, uh, instead uh, Jose Holmberg here came into the picture and helped us uh, with subjects and also to uh, get the study going. So we used uh, uh, roller skis on the treadmill and uh, put in catheters. I will not, go, I mean, you can see we had one up here to get uh, what happens in the upper uh, or, or the arms and upper part of the thorax. 
and then we had one in the heart and then we had some to measure what happens uh, uh, over the exercising leg and uh, in that way we had complete control of the different areas uh, systemic arms shoulders and legs and we could then also calculate the torso and uh, uh, classical skiing and uh, some of you many maybe may have seen it but uh, uh, you have to agree with me that this, this really looked like ordinary uh, uh, diagonal skiing. So they are not uh, really limited with all the catheters uh, they have in their body. Uh, uh, so uh, then uh, that's uh, double pooling and uh, yeah, it works quite well. Uh, that was surprising it's also to me <laughs> uh, but anyway uh, uh, then uh, could we confirm Nils Secker's data and this is some sort of a peak uh, blood flows to the arms uh, uh, and, and uh, to the legs and then we had uh, then when they performed classical arm plus leg and you can see arms and legs there was this drop in spite of that they tried as hard as they could uh, uh, the blood flow did go down and the reason uh, we think just like Nils Secker that uh, the heart just can't uh, produce the cardiac output needed uh, to supply all uh, exercising muscles with an optimal flow. I will finish this part uh, with uh, just analyzing uh, a little bit more carefully some uh, other variables. Uh, they are published by Horsey in, in different papers or articles and uh, make you aware of that cross-country skiing is a little bit special. You have heard about that with hard exercise top athletes there is this desaturation and there, if you look here the diagonal in the middle, there is a small tendency for a drop with diagonal. But with double pooling, where you then up here, uh, you don't see it. And uh, the oxygen uptakes here, they are high. I mean, they are six liters and some even more. So uh, that, uh, in a paper that uh, Jose Olper has uh, written with Jose Calbe, they they then checking on the saturation a little bit more carefully with double pooling and diagonal. This is uh, close to max and then max and then there is this difference. Double pooling is really uh, surprisingly, you know, high oxygen uptakes without a tendency really more than a couple of percent, three maybe a drop in, in uh, saturation. So that's uh, that makes cross country skiing uh, say special and uh, uh, in, in the right corner in the bill on uh, the low part uh, you can see that we have tried to do estimation of the respiration uh, how much the cost of respiration and you know Jared Dempsey and others they think it may go up to 15% of the whole oxygen uptake during a maximal uh, effort but uh, in cross-country skiing, especially in double pooling, it's, uh, it's much less, which also then of course means that you can uh, perform uh, at a higher intensity uh, than you can in other uh, sports. Now, uh, the last part uh, in a way uh, on this thing, that is um, oxygen extraction, because I've talked a lot about these uh, mitochondria and their importance and so on. And it's thought of being really important for uh, uh, this uh, enlarged uh, oxygen uptake at the muscle level. That the mitochondria is a limiting factor in a way. I don't think that is the case. What is really critical, that is how many capillaries you are. Uh, that you have. Here is then from different studies put together capillaries and also the muscle blood flow, in part estimated muscle blood flows. 
And uh, then at the bottom in the bars, you can see the oxygen extraction. This is, is impressive, you know. Uh, if you take the elite to the far right, you have increased compared to sedentary people at least double the input of flow as well as then oxygen uh, uh, volume or oxygen delivery. And uh, in the elite guys, they can really extract almost all that. And I think that the uh, explanation is that if anything, the number of capillaries in the skeletal muscle uh, of the elite has become elevated more than the mean or muscle blood flow. Uh, and that then means that the mean transit time being a little bit less than a second uh, in the inactive, uh, it's uh, 50, no, 0, 55. The reason why the reason why it is uh, uh, a little bit higher in the inactive is that they have so low uh, cardiac output because their heart cannot produce much of a cardiac output, and then you can see the muscle blood flow is is quite low. So uh, easily uh, you can see going then up muscle blood flow and compare with how much the capillaries increase. Uh, capillaries increase more than relatively more than the muscle blood flow and then mean transit time is elongated. And with that longer time passing through the capillary then uh, more of that oxygen can be then trans third from the hemoglobin into the mitochondria. Uh, uh, so most critical in cross-country skiing, heart and muscle capillaries. Mitochondria also of importance, but uh, primarily for which substrate that can be used for energy production in the muscle. With that, I think I should uh, stop, and then uh, my last part, uh, I will keep to myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, today it's uh, it, it's really worth to consider because it's uh, not that dramatic and so difficult. So so that should be a, at least an aspect that one try. Mm. Mitt universitetet upptäckt dina möjligheter.